welcome to another presentation of the Open Book Tour. Um, we are winding toward the end of um, the, six, the exhibition of six singular artists. And um, we are thrilled to have um, the artist Charles Hobson with us today. His um, beautiful work is displayed in the two uh, right-hand cabinets. And, um, and Charles um, lives in San Francisco and has been kind enough to come up here to talk to us today about his work. Um, Charles started out, uh, I believe, at the UVA as a lawyer and um, had a wonderful practice uh, where he was known for his um, grasp of concepts and wonderful language. And mid-career, which is sometimes known as retirement, he <laughs> totally um, came to devote his, um, his professional life to the, um, the other passion uh, from his youth, which was art. And most recently, for the past 15, I believe, years, you have done? 25. 25 for a, a book art. Wow. 25. We are um, thrilled to have him here. Um, Charles is going to be talking about a book that was uh, new to this collection a few months ago, Mermaid, um, that he has not had a chance to tell us about before, and also um, a book that's in progress. So please welcome Cheryl Thompson. Thank you, Jay. Um, good morning. So I'm so glad you're all here this morning. I love talking with people who are interested in artists' books. Last night, uh, we had a very animated dinner and uh, around, uh, partly around the question of what is an artist book. And you can go on for several days looking at that question, but uh, what I explained in partway through that conversation is whenever I'm at a cocktail party and someone says, oh, you're an artist, what kind of art do you do? I say, well, I'm an artist. I work with the book as an expressive medium called artist books. And they said, I don't get it. And I said, well, let me tell you about a book. It's called taking off Emily Dickinson's clothes, and it's a, a book you have to unbutton the pages of to read. And all of a sudden, the concept of the book as a whole comes through to the audience, and they, uh, they seem mildly interested sometimes. So I actually, I, this was one of the books on display. So you will see that this idea of undressing is embedded in the in the book, and you, you come up with the basic title and the book with, you have to remove the garter. And um, I'm going to read you just uh, one or two lines. Um, the complexity of women's undergarments in 19th century America is not to be waved off, and I proceeded like a polar explorer through clips and clasps and moorings, catches straps and whalebone stays, sailing towards the iceberg of her nakedness. And now at this point, you have to untie the pages and undo the button. I always fumble at this. It's very nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and then, then you find uh, an illustration with a feather which fits into uh, a poem. Uh, and this is an accordion, meaning that you, you can expose more than one page at, spread at a time. The, um, there is a small quote at the end. It's actually from Emily Dickinson. The poem was by Billy Collins, which maybe you all know. Um, Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul and sings the tune without the words that never stops at all. Emily Dickinson. Uh, I spoke briefly already with someone about how frequently mistakes guide you to a new um, understanding. And when this book was printed, it was printed letter press by um, Andrew Hoyam in uh, San Francisco at Arion Press, I had envisioned that this was a block and that this was a block 
that was opposite this block. You, you follow what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. uh, but in the proofing, the pages that came with the proof were so big that I didn't catch that. So I had the whole book printed with that defect, and I was too embarrassed to send it back. <laughs> it would have, you know, Andrew Hoyam is a figure of great importance, and I didn't want to reveal my. So the answer, though, came with the fact that if I put a button at the bottom, Perfect. it gave some balance. Now that was a great ingredient because then um, I oh, tied on the back when the button um, had to be sewn in the definition of two words. The first line of the poem, taking off Emily Dickinson's clothes, first, her tippet made of tulle. Now, most women know what tulle is, but tippet is a, is a so th what's on the back here is the definition of a tippet, which is a covering for the shoulders as with long, as with fur with long ends that hang in front. So it's kind of like a skinny pashmina or something like that. And a tool, of course, you all know, uh, a fine, often starched net of silk rayon or nylon used especially for veils, tutus, and gowns. And you'll notice that the image in here is of a ballet dancer wearing partly a tulle a dress. So, so uh, about two years ago, the University of Washington Library sponsored an exhibition of, and, and commissioned 20 artists to make books for, for exhibition at uh, the university library around the subject of myth and mythology because there was an international conference of, of uh, classics professors that were coming. And uh, Sandra Krupa, who's the very fine curator there, asked, uh, asked several of us to make a book. The, um, the way she managed it was she sent out about 50 myths and you could choose one to work with. And I wound up choosing uh, a, a, a myth, which I now call Mermaid, which is a poem by a Salish um, Native American. And um, so I, have to, I, I want to point out to you, this is a book that largely is designed to be seen on display although it does have a sequential interesting story to it. The story comes um, from, from Paul Wagner. And it is pre presented here as a long, unpunctuated, in many cases, un, uh, not ungrammatical, but the context is off a little bit. Tenses lapse from one side to the other. And this is because in the oral tradition, when a uh, story is being told by Native Americans, there is a kind of flow to it that doesn't sustain traditional Western punctuation. So, so for example, I'm going to read you the first. It was a hot summer day, and this beautiful mermaid was washing her hair in the sun upon a great stone at the beach. The merwoman lay down and she fell asleep. A young girl was walking down to the same beach. So this is about an encounter between uh, a young human and uh, a mermaid. And their interchange involves going to and from the mermaid's world. And it's about reflection. So the, um, the concept of reflection clued me into an image I'd been harboring to do something with for a long time of young, this is, this is uh, in Stinson Beach where we spend a lot of time in very low tides, I'm sure you have this here, the, the water comes in and creates a mirror where uh, people will stand and you'll see their reflection. And so this, if you are in the right angle, you will see the reflection of the mermaid 
This is upside down, of course, showing it the reflection, and that side puts it right side up when you see the reflection. And so there are the story. Oh, the other the other thing that was critical in this book was when they are all set up, having them be um, opened at the same angle. And I, f I found a way of making these little folded pieces of uh, heavy mat board, which there was just enough of a crevice in the front that they could be folded and put behind it so that you got just the right amount of, of uh, angle. You have to do a little. We lost two of them. <laughs> well, they're easy to repair, replace. I mean, <laughs> it's about a 25 cent reproduction. So you can see, you can see that standing in front of them as you move, you will catch the reflection of the mermaid in the text, which is laid out on a sheet that can be lifted off. So, um, the, um, so this work represents a kind of uh, response to an idea that was formulated by someone else. Typically, I'm on my, you know, I'm just responding to things that, that really grabbed me. Uh, for example, uh, taking off Emily Dickinson's clothes was a poem read by Garrison Keillor on the Poet's Almanac as I was driving across the Bay Bridge one morning and I nearly drove off the bridge. <laughs> so, so what I'm going to do is instead of passing this all around, I'm going to pass this, which is the book explanation. And, and this, is, this is a prospectus. And when I do an edition of 20 or 30 copies, uh, I send out a prospectus, an announcement to people that have been buying my books. And in this case, the idea is you have to send something to them that make them at least notice it, for starters, and secondly, like it enough to take the risk of me, willing to be, me being willing to send a book on approval. So if they don't like it, they can send it back. But they don't want to take it if they don't think they're going to keep it. So you have to make it really seductive. So this, this little You'll see it. I wanted to have it show how it looks, mm -hmm. how the book works. So you can page through this and get <coughs> all kinds of information. I'll send that that way, and I'll send this that way, because I think passing this around is a little <coughs> too complicated. The images themselves, are, oh. did you create those? Yes, those are, uh, there are monotypes based on you know, photographs from the scene, and then, uh, then, then uh, digitally captured. And so these are digital, high-level digital reprints of uh, hand-colored monotypes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm hopeful, well, a monotype has been a, a sort of a chief way of working. A monotype is uh, a painting that you do on a, today, a piece of plexiglass. In Degas time, it would have been on a piece of metal. You do the painting with special inks, and you put a damp piece of paper on top of it, run it through a press, peel that off, and you've got a one-of-a-kind print called a monotype. You can also take that same plate and print it a second time, and you'll get what's called a ghost. A ghost is a, because it's fainter. And, and you actually can do a counterproof, which is to take that first print that was the one of a kind, and while it's still wet, put a second piece of paper on top of it, run it back through the press with a little higher pressure, and the, the first impression prints off onto a second page. So you actually can get three images in a situation where, where you really only were looking for one. Each of them is completely different. And, uh, in this book also that same? Yes, same process. It reminded me of Degas. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, Degas has been my main man. Um, um, when I first started working with monotypes, um, I, I, uh, I had found that I, the monotype I made didn't really work. But I found that if I hand colored it with pastel, I could fix it. 
and I thought I'd invented a new way of working. And <laughs> it turned out my friend Joseph Goldine said when I called him up, I said, Joe, I got this great new way of working with the monotype and pastels over it. Isn't that terrific? He said, yeah, you should look at Degas. <laughs> <laughs> and because uh, actually probably a half to three quarters of Degas works on paper that are pastels of dancers and bathers are monotypes that have been, they look like pastels, but he's, he's worked over the, the, uh, the, the monotype. The monotype ink gives the paper a certain quality of, of texture and, and you know, almost a change of quality that takes the, mon takes the pastel in a very... That's how he got his depth and richness. Yeah, oh. yeah. Do you, do you use a one plate process with, with the monotype? Yes. Just, do, just print yeah, once. Just print once. And then you get to print and then you hand color that way. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, well, let me see if I can... So speaking of my friend Degas, this is, this is a book called Writing on the Body, which um, is Degas' words with my images as, as uh, now these are etchings that have been slightly hand colored. Uh, they've been printed um, a la poupée, meaning that on the plate they were added. It was not just black and white. It was, they're, they're colored images, but the, but the plate is actually loaded with color bef before you print it. So, and this again is an accordion, and it uh, it talks about how Degas saw the figure. It was kind of an audacious thing for me to do because I mean you're talking about Degas and me doing pictures, but. Um, I've integrated uh, his handwriting into the print. And uh, for example, Degas says, oh, let's do this one, it's shorter. Make a drawing, begin it again, make a tracing of it, begin it again, trace it again. So it's just clear. So I send this one that way there. Good. Um, so anybody have any questions? I really, if you have something you'd like to ask, please don't hesitate. I'm going to uh, show you some of this work I'm doing on a new book. Can I ask you a question about the monotype? Of course. You made 20 copies of that book? Yes, but so the monotype was, uh, well, actually of Mermaid, I only made nine copies, but um, the images were done as a monotype, scanned, printed out digitally, on, and then hand colored okay. Got it. a little bit. Not, it wasn't an enormous effort to do the extra hand coloring. Okay. Do you Photoshop anything? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's, see, this is kind of the, the end of the cycle where I was working with copper plates. Um, and fo this is actually a photogravure, uh, photogravure etching. So, um, and you can see that it embosses the page, and it's uh, it's they're wonderful. But then, as things moved forward, I saw I could get color and richness in the monotype worked on after it came out of the computer printer and I could do editions of 30 or 40 copies and have it carry that. Um, so this project is called Flight. And it's about five figures, that is people, sort of, who, were, who expressed the passion for learning to fly before the Wright brothers. And it starts out with uh, Daedalus, who was the father of Icarus. And it's Leonardo da Vinci, who studied birds and how to make a flying machine for 30 years. It involves a remarkable 
Englishman named George Cayley, who in 1800, for the next 50 years, explored aeronautics and created some of the most uh, effective descriptions of the way aeronautics at worked, and actually built some glider-type machines. Uh, the, the, uh, there's a Frenchman named Jean Labrie, who was a sea captain and got el completely entranced with albatross and watching the albatross. So he then um, stopped being a sea, sea captain and spent a considerable amount of time making an artificial albatross, uh, which he, he managed to get flying a little. And finally, uh, a, a German named Otto Lilienthal, who really was just on the edge of getting done what the Wright brothers did uh, when he crashed. But he'd had a very important impact because he was clearly flying. There were some photographs. He got people to photograph him so that people knew around the world that this could happen. If you were working on a flight in the, in the 19th century, people thought you were absolutely mad because it was just assumed. And it was even God did not want human beings to fly. If he had, he'd have given them wings, you know, that kind of stuff. So I sort of. I got started. This is my first prototype, and it was just to see what I might do. So this, and this is the key idea. This, this right here uh, is the is the crux of what I was trying to prove. So I have the stories of each of these five figures. That's kind of factual, but then there is a fictional piece of data that I made up. And I'll give you an example. Um, with Icarus and Daedalus, um, this, their, their myth takes place on the island of Crete. And uh, Daedalus is a very wonderful craftsman. And the king of, of, Crete, of Crete uh, employs him um, to do various things. Uh, but the problem with the king was that he had kept a white bull that Zeus, uh, that uh, Poseidon had given him for offerings. And the king decided to keep the bull for himself. Poseidon became very upset. And so he made the king's wife lust after a bull. And her lust was so great that she wound up hiring Daedalus to build her an artificial cow in which she could get inside and, and mate with the bull, which she did. And she became pregnant, and she gave, she gave birth to the Minotaur, the bull-headed human being. And um, then the king got Daedalus to build the labyrinth to put the Minotaur far <laughs> in it. So I guess it wouldn't be an embarrassment to him. But he, uh, he thought no one could get in it. But then for some reason, Daedalus uh, showed an enemy of the king a way to get into the labyrinth and to kill the Minotaur. So this really irritated the king. And he put Daedalus, and now a son, Icarus, in, in the labyrinth to, to hold them hostage. Okay, and, and the, the legend, of course, is that then Daedalus um, got some feathers and figured out how to buy wing, build wings and had his son and himself strap these on and attempted to fly or to fly away from Crete. And it was seeming to be successful, but he had warned his son Icarus not to fly too high or too close to the sun or the wax which was holding the wings on would melt and he would die. And of course, that's what happened. And so Icarus has become the symbol of high aspiration, but too much risk taking, and, and also fulfilling this idea of the, the, the wish to fly. So that's, those are the facts. Um, what, what um, and oh, by the way, Daedalus, in, the, the queen, in order to repay Daedalus for building the artificial cow, she gave him her handmaiden for 
sexual favors. And the handmaiden had a son who was Icarus. Oh. At least that's what the legend says. So I've written an imaginary piece which reads, My dear queen, it's been so long since I've seen you. I miss you so much and I hope the king has still not discovered that Icarus is our son. I think he still believes that your serving girl, Necrate, is the mother. Icarus, Icarus and I are going, to, are going stirry crazy here and since the king imprisoned us, I got an idea about how to escape, but I need your help. Can you get me several baskets of feathers and a large ball of string? I think I can make some wings so Icarus and I can fly away from here. I'll need some wax too, but there's lots of that in the candles in the labyrinth. Can you get those feathers and string for me? I treasure you and I hope you can get away from the king and meet me in Sicily where we are headed with great love, Daedalus. <laughs> <laughs> and so this, this comes in a small paper airplane, <laughs> which, you which was spawn spawned by the idea that, well, if, how does he get word to her? And so, and, and on the back of that is an antique map of Crete. And if you look up in the upper left corner, there is actually a part of the sea called I Icarum. That, that got me working toward another version, which, was, which is this one. And I, uh, by this time, I've, I've gotten a, uh, you know, a cover and the actual text. And then, in some case, let me see what I've got. <laughs> okay, what I really want to have you see is, this is a series of clouds, really. Am I getting it, getting it right? Okay. So, uh, and I was continuing to, to work with the idea of the story and the fiction. And and it was okay. But there was something that troubled me, and so I made a larger version. which is called, again, Flight. But it's the same now. It's got, yeah, thank you. If you just make that, that seems to fall over. And, and a lot of this is, again, I can't tell whether I've got the right page for you or not, but you can see uh, there's a, a kind of sequence and flow of the clouds, of the stories, and um, and the paper airplanes. So uh, this is all put together, by the way, with double-sided low stick tape. So it's like so building a collage where if you want to change something around, you can. So I've, I've dealt with different, loca different clouds and different locations. And, um, and I've worked the text through. And then as things have evolved, I've made some changes. And just last week, I reached the conclusion that this approach, these are bobby pins, <laughs> so that you can take the airplane out to read it. But the trouble is that the tips of the airplane get abraded fairly quickly. And so you're, you're basically building a book which has you know, a defect buried in it. It's like, in some ways, like painting on unprimed canvas. You kind of, if you're doing it, you got to do it knowing what you're doing. And you know, so, not a good idea. So, that troubled me. The other thing that troubled me was, once one took it out and read it, then you'd have to put it back in, and you'll see that, okay? And it also, if you squeezed it, you know, you might, it might be a complete mess. That, that wasn't working. Um, and the way I had dealt with it to some extent was this, this is a <coughs> prototype cover, 
which is much fatter on there than it needs to be so that it would tolerate this. So that's where I was two weeks ago. And um, one of the things about artist books is you have to learn to give up good ideas. <laughs> so the bobby pin idea has now gone away. Partly because I had sitting in my studio from a, a trial seven years ago of where I had stuck, you know, a little paper airplane in a slit. I said, oh, man, would that be a... I loved, I loved the way this looked with the plane right in the middle. I thought it that... It looks like sailboats sailing across the sky, and it's the same concept as the physics of an airplane wing. So, uh, so again, I'm going to pass this around. This is with the bobby pin. And this is one. This is one I put in with tape. Now the problem with that, of course, is you can't get it out to look at the back, and it still has some of the problem of not getting refolded <coughs> properly. So here, this was my first trial using a center split. And what's great is you see the, the sky looks great with the even though it had holes cut in it. And, um, but then I got looking and I said, well, I really liked it towards the center. Well, I said, well, of course you can, you can, uh, you can move it around, Charles. Why don't you, why don't you tilt it more towards the center? And, uh, and th there's still some experimentation I can do to see how that works. Let me just... Uh, Charles, question? Certainly. Um, all the little airplanes, so each airplane, I mean, you've got a lot of little airplanes. How, uh, what is the info that is in each one of the airplanes? It's a, well, there, always the same letter or no? No, no, it's a letter for each of the five circumstances. Got it. Okay. okay. So in the case of uh, uh, Lilienthal, yeah. who died in one of his glider flights, he had a brother who was working with him very closely. I mean, it's similar to the Wrights. They were both really competent engineers and made a lot of money in an engineering world. But they, uh, when he, cr so the letter to, the letter in the Lilienthal story is his brother writing to him from Munich saying, you know, I'll be back in two weeks. Don't try the new glider until I get there. And ha have you made sure you've gotten your life insurance updated? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> you have to put yourself in, in, in the no, imaginary no, setting. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to pass that oh, over? <laughs> so, um, Okay, so then every time you're working with an accordion, there's a question of what do you do with the back? And in some cases, you, you just leave it plain. I mean, because the, 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 the guts of the thing is on the front. And you don't want to put anything on the back, which is totally necessary for the story in the front. But on the other hand, you think, what? I mean, you just operate with the structure and the oppor opportunities. And so my latest um, series of, and this is totally uh, just beginning. Um, I'll show you. Oh, that's not it. Hold it. OK. So this is a monotype of an osprey. And ospreys were the kind of birds that um, were on the island of Crete. So these are the kinds of birds that Daedalus would have been looking at when he was pondering about flying. And Leonardo was fascinated by bats. 
And you can even see, let's see, I'm going to tie on what size should the bat be. Uh, but, but you, uh, so let's assume you use a big bat. And then, um, George Cayley, the Englishman, was uh, red kites were uh, around in Yorkshire where he was. So this is the kind of bird he would have been looking at. And, um, and then uh, Labrie, who is the, th these have just been printed to see how they print on this gray paper. That, that's not even located in the right place, but you, mm -hmm. you can begin to get the idea. There's, there's the albatross. And finally, uh, Lilienthal was focused on all things storks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm thinking, well, this isn't bad, but it's not, I mean, just to have them on the back is not satisfactory. So what I think I'm going to do is in this version, we'll have the, I'm going to, I'm going to re reproduce the image of the bird that relates to the person being examined and put a very small version of it here and have the airplane here. So you see that kind of balances the, 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 the off-centeredness. And then on the back, I will put a piece of text somewhere. You see, the, the way this works is every other one of these This, every one of these will have a blank piece of gray in between. Mm -hmm. you, you follow me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the back. Yeah, we're looking at the back completely. And so, so there'll be a bird on one. Mm -hmm. And then there's a, there's a blank. So it seemed... You know, again, what do you do with the blank page? Mm -hmm. And, I, and I've, I've not worked that out completely. Um, I may do a little uh, bird watching ornithological thing about the red kite. Or, yeah. And so then after, so this is not necessary for the substance of the book, but you get an extra little gift in the back by seeing, and a note, you know, that, that Icarus's time, you know. Mm -hmm. That bird was the kind of bird that they would have watched flying. And it's by great good goodness, I mean, they're all, they're all different. I mean, it's amazing that they were all inspired by different birds. They're so beautiful. Yeah. Mm. So I can, I'll pass those around that way if you like. And can you describe how long this process? <laughs> <laughs> I did, you know, I, your meticulousness of the investigation of every aspect of the book is fascinating. Well, thank you. Um, well, it depends. Usually, it's about a year, but this one's taken. This one's this one's been going on for eighteen months, partly because I was interrupted by some things. But uh, um, so the identity of each of the protagonists is revealed through the letter. It's revealed. No, there's no. Do you give any advance information about before you do the fictional in, in, letter? Yeah. Is okay. There so an identification that so. you say this man was X X. Yeah. So this is the, this is part of the introduction. Uh, the human urge to fly like the birds has been an enduring passion passion for centuries. Here are five tales giving testament to the strength of that urge from the years before 1903 when the Wright brothers made su sustained flight a reality. So there's Daedalus in the second century in Greece. There's Leonardo da Vinci in 1482 until his death in 1519 in Italy. There's Sir George Cayley until his death in 1853 in, Germ in England. Jean-Marie Labrie, who uh, was in France, worked for 11 years, and Otto Lilienthal until his death in 1896. Um, each tale starts with the details of a human attempt at flight, followed by an image 
of the sky in which a paper airplane with a fictional letter has been attached. Uh, and at one point, okay, here's, so the, a duplicate copy of each plane is provided at the back of the book so you can examine its structure and the fiction it holds. So when I was still struggling with how to deal with that paper, the bobby pin situation, I had decided I would print a complete second set of the airplanes, put them in the back of the book, give you instructions about how to fold a paper airplane. <laughs> so you could do that yourself and that would ameliorate to some extent the fact that the tip was getting bent. I may still do that, but these, the slit lets me have confidence that the plane is not going to be uh, smushed. Smush. That engages the reader in the act of creation and flight. So here, if, if you want to take a quick, that's that's the current dummy, but with the bobby pins. I think will this yeah. edition of this issue be? Do you know? Twenty-five. Mm -hmm. I say that with a grimace because. <laughs> oh, actually, by the way, you don't want to. What's the word? You don't want to be a coward. You, I mean, the bobby pin thing is such a great idea. <laughs> <laughs> and I've bought, I mean, I've got hundreds of bobby pins now. And they've had to be spray painted. And then they've had to be, you have to take a pair of wire cutters and clip off the little piece that comes up on the bobby pin, you know, that lets you, because that would, you know, that doesn't fit. And that's incredibly hard, those bobby pins. Yeah. And so, and they, you know, you got to do it in a box. So when you clip it off, the pieces fly away. And then you've got to, then you've got to, um, you've got to drill a hole. You've got to put the bobby pin through it after you've printed the page. You've got to put some backing on it. You got to, this dummy doesn't have that, but you, you need to put a, a piece of Tyvek or uh, backing material over it so it doesn't wiggle itself. Uh, and so that's got to be done before you put on the backing pages. <laughs> and uh, the, the end result is that it was taking so much effort and I still wasn't satisfied with the results. So this, the slit, oh, it's so much easier. <laughs> and so you want to make sure you're not abandoning something because it's easier. Not abandoning something that's good because it's easier, but this is... It's beautiful the way you have it tucked in there. The slit is... Yeah, I, I think that that's a very, it's, it's now satisfactory. My dear wife, Sandra, who's there, uh, saw it this morning for the first time, and she said, oh, yes, that works great. <laughs> so that's why I actually was really comfortable showing it to you. Could you speak to the, uh, the mono prints just a bit more? Oh, um, you, did, you did these clouds as mono prints. That's right. You, you print them off, to, and the yeah. birds, too. Right. Is it... Uh, printing ink on on a plastic or a metal plate? Yeah, on a plastic plate. Plastic plate. Okay. So uh, there's a section. Why don't you pass those around? These are these are a little gift. Uh, this is called Why I Love Books, and this is a museum exhibition at the Bolinas Museum, in near our house in Stinson Beach, and. Um, I should have taken the wrapping off, but... Oh, no, I've never taken the wrapping off. <laughs> <laughs> They're keeping it in pristine condition. But there's a section in here that talks about monotypes Ooh. on page 8 and talks about how they work. Oh, that's wow. good. Good. Uh, and this is, uh, this is a <coughs> sort of a, a... This is an overview of my work until about 10 years ago when this exhibition took place. But I've always regarded it as very valuable. And it contains, on page 6, my, um, right here, this is my um, mantra. And when I'm teaching and when I'm trying to explain to anybody what uh, they, what would books offer in the way of creative expression, I ask them to look at this. And it is, if you conceive of a book as a medium of expression, like sculpture or painting, you'll notice that a book has unique qualities. It has sequence, 
and flow, and it naturally combines word and image, and it has sculptural qualities. These are all like tools in the book artist's work, work box. Sequence means one thing comes before another. It, it, it affects the narrative impact in dramatic ways. Flow offers the opportunity to create a cadence or melody. Is the page full to the brim, or is there only a single word on the page? A kind of music arises from this placement. Combining word and image heightens the creative effect of either picture or text alone. It's a case of one plus one equals three. Moreover, a book's, a book's sculptural quality <coughs> offers surprising opportunities to present and enhance the creative notions inherent in its subject. So uh, you all now have, now have in writing the... Did, it, did everybody get one or we need one more? Yes. You're welcome. <laughs> so, um, I've never done that before. Uh, that is to show a book in process to yes, people. I, uh, extraordinarily helpful. generous on your part. Well, thank you. I, Put some of the people sitting around the table today make books themselves. Oh, yeah. So. Absolutely. Well, I, you're, you're in the process of setting up a place for people to make artist books, aren't you? Yes. Yeah, so. Um, yeah, it's a privilege. I, I, someone asked me how I got into books, and I, you may know this in the stories in this little catalog, but I had a friend die uh, when I was 40, and um, another friend or two, uh, in order to memorialize him, took three of his essays and made a little book. That is to say, we supervised a designer who then got the book published. It's about this size, by the way, uh, at a poetry press in Berkeley. And uh, we got the books back. And it was a revelation to me. A human being could make a book, <laughs> which was something that had not entered my world until I got that. Wow. And, um, so he, he's really, his death was a gift to me because I got that tilt. Uh, and then I started doing, uh, I, was, I was taking printmaking classes at the Art Institute then, and I wound up immediately moving toward matching words and image together. And, and the early books are more like uh, writing on the body where you have actual copper plate etching and photogravure. And then as we get later, you get to, uh, um, the, the, you know, the s s going to the dark side of the force by using the, c the computer. <laughs> <laughs> this is gorgeous. It's absolutely gorgeous. Oh, and by the way, uh, accordions are sometimes held in slight disrepute by fine press people and some some people who regard the codex, which is, the codex is the form we all know in regular books. You know, the pages are sewn in the center. And, but uh, the advantage of, I'll just make a point of this. So you, you can read this like a regular two-page spread book. And then, and uh, the person who printed this was an amazing uh, treasure in San Francisco named Jack Stoffaker. Uh, and, and he's now in his early 90s. But he's, he's printed this. And he said to me, you know, you know, this text that you've got opposite the image is something that I had just given it to him. Bum, 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 bum. And he said, well, why don't you vary where it is on the page? And this is a great example of that concept of flow, where if you, think, if you just look at you see the, the text now actually has a kind of a musical reading as you go through. Um, and. Um, 
Any other questions? What type of, excuse me, go ahead. What type of paper? Uh, I use a lot of BFK Reeves. It's a French mold made paper. It's kind of my standard starting point. Um, and um, and you were going to ask. What what's the material you're using to laminate the t the pages together in the back? The strip of paper that's. Oh, what I'm using in the dummy is a double sided low stick tape, and when I when I go to make them permanently. I, you, you could use um, rice paste or P PVA polyvinyl acetate, which is Elmer's glue. Is Now, the trouble with Elmer's glue is it's a wet glue. So if you take a brush and stroke the edge of a page, it wettens it. And unless you keep everything under weight for two days, it winds up. So I have discovered this archival glue stick called PRITT, P-R-I-T-T. And it works great uh, for a limited amount of stuff. Like when this goes together, you, we're just going to be putting glue along here and along there. You don't have to glue the center. So one swipe, one swipe. Uh, there are some other uh, glue sticks that are represented as being archival. The reason I say that is because I've had a terrible time getting Prit. Prit has, I don't know what happened, but Henkel, H-E-N-K-L-E, or E-L-E, uh, in Germany makes it. It's a big company. Uh, they, uh, they, they no longer distribute it in the United States. So, um, but it, uh, I found if you go on Google and go to Amazon, of course, you can find it coming from Japan or Canada, sometimes, and you can get it. But if you look around in the art supply websites or stores, you'll see there will be some glue stick that's represented to be archival, and that should be fine, too. I've just used it, you know, how it is. You get using a material, and you just rely on it yourself. What is the actual strip made of? Is it Tyvek, the strip of paper that you're gluing in there, to? Oh, no, it's, 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 it's just... Um, So this accordion is using, so this strip here. It's glued to the whole page. It's is just, glue, is just a strip of glue. I'll just put a strip of glue down this side okay. and this side. And then I'll take, you know, another page. I don't know. So, so they're alternating. OK. And let me think if you see it. In the but I, I think your question related to the final product. Yeah. What is the um, what is the hinge material for the final product? Um, in this one. Oh, let's see what that one is. That's. Uh, that. Oh. <laughs> right there. Yes, that's uh, that's rice. That's rice paper or rice Japan paper. paper. Okay. Um, wow. But. Tyvek is the answer. Yeah. Tyvek is stable and it's strong. I mean, it's just fabulous. And uh, I'm always amused now driving around and seeing um, buildings covered with Tyvek. <laughs> I think it is the same one then. Yeah, it's the same stuff. You, if you really wanted to try it without putting a lot of money down, you can go to the post office and all of those free envelopes they give you or Tyvek, and you just take an envelope and cut it up, and you get the strips and see if it works for you. The envelopes that you cannot yeah. tear. Right. right. Those are Tyvek. Yeah, I'm sorry, I didn't understand your oh, that's, question. That's a, well, I got two yeah, answers out of it, so I got that answer too. So that's good. <laughs> so. Um, How long will you will it be before you have your finished product? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've prompted a, a, perhaps an interesting question. Um, I try to get one book a year done. And uh, Mermaid was my last book. Um, so this will be a 2017 book, but it probably won't be done until the end of the year. Uh, there is a book 
exhibition in a San Francisco gallery every year in April. Every two years, there's a major book exhibition in San Francisco Bay Area called Codex. I, I recommend, this is worth a trip. This, this, this is uh, book maker, book artists' books from all over the world. Uh, Germany, Japan, China, South America come. There are about, uh, I don't know, 300 exhibitors. You can get, you can get so much from visiting that, and it goes on for four or five days. Um, and I try to get a new book done for that, but that's not until 2018. So I, have, so I tell you those dates only because the pattern, or when you're working on something that you are the boss on, you also have to, um, what's the word? You have to be careful about not getting too immersed in a detail. You need to get the thing done. On the other hand, you don't have a deadline, so you, you can take some extra time. What's the gallery in San Francisco? Uh, Seeger, S-E-A-G-E-R, Gray, G-R-A-Y. Seeger Gray. And they have a beautiful website, and she has, she has book exhibitions all the time. Seeger Gray, uh, and S-E-A-G-E-R. Uh, and I was explaining to someone last night when we were having this question about what is an artist book. She loves artist books, but she's a commercial gallery. She has to make enough money to keep the place open. And artist books in general are the poetry of the art world. You know, hardly anybody makes money. So people do it. It's all very authentic when it's done because people are just doing it because it's responding to their personal passions. The, um, the fact is, though, you, you, uh, you have this, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, it was, the question was, um, Donna Seeger's gallery and exhibitions. Anyway, oh, she, she uh, in order to make the money, she has a, these book exhibitions about Three quarters of it are artist books. Would, would look like this. Uh, the other quarter are brilliant uh, sculptural pieces that hinge on the existence of the of the book as a starting point. Altered books, uh, books cut up into small pieces and sewn into a collage. Um, things that are on the push you towards considering it as fine art rather than as artist books. She needs to do that so that all her art buyers that come in will be led gently into the idea that a book itself could be art. So, so she's, uh, she's doing a great job with that. And um, OK, well, I think. That was amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Special treat. Thank you.